This episode is sponsored by the IoT Job Site, the world's only dedicated space for applying for and advertising IoT vacancies across the world. Register now for job alerts or get in touch via Let's Talk at the IoT Job Site.com. Welcome to the IoT Podcast Show. As always, please subscribe, share, and get involved in the comments. Today we're joined by Simon Van Yacht. Simon is the CEO of Noe. Noe is an energy harvesting business specialising in power management technology. Simon, welcome to the IoT Podcast Show. Thank you. Good to be here. It's good. It's good to see you here. Uh, yeah. Simon, just to kick off and explain a little bit about your business, Nowi, for people that may not understand it or indeed heard of the company, can you talk a little bit about the business and and your background, if you could, please? Um, Yeah, so what what we're doing at Nowi is we develop uh, energy harvesting power management chips, uh, and and our philosophy around that is relatively straightforward. So what we try to do is make uh, make the implementation of uh, of energy harvesting and, and you know creating products that don't require frequent battery changes and and, and things like that, uh, make that cheaper, smaller, and simpler. Right? So we want to lower the threshold for having uh, batteryless and easy to use products. And so we've been doing that at Noe for. Uh, Close to five years now, uh, and uh, and that's that's you know my, my background in that sense very much related to it because uh, I started this with uh, another co-founder right out of university. So Delft University of uh, Technology uh, happens to be uh, one of the leading universities in terms of uh, energy harvesting uh, research, um, and uh, you know, we've kind of taken that knowledge base and see well can we take this from academic research into something that's actually commercially useful uh, and, and and help people make uh, make better products. Yeah, I mean that, but that's fantastic, and such a such a sustainable view on where we're going as 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 a planet, right? Um, and something that's really called for, uh, you know, here here, here in uh, here in the world. It's interesting actually because I knew Delft was a fantastic university, but I didn't know so much on on e- energy harvesting in particular. Actually, um, it, it, and has that been the case for some time or? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, uh, like I often say, we have one of the least innovative things uh, you could possibly do in the technology <laughs> world uh, because it's been around for such a long time. So literally Nikola Tesla uh, 100 years ago was experimenting with energy harvesting. Uh, and you've seen plenty of sort of different things pop up over the last century, really uh, experimenting with it. So it's been sort of this steady stream of research going on in energy harvesting. For the most part, it had no sort of commercial purpose, really. There's not much you could do with it outside of a lab environment. Yeah. Um, and that's really changed over the last, you know, I would say less than 10 years, probably, and especially in the last few years. Um, and, and, and the reason why I think it's quite simple is, is on the one hand, you know, we're getting better and better at doing energy harvesting, right? So we're able to capture more and more energy from our environment. Although at some point that is fundamentally limited because you know, the thing in energy harvesting is that you're converting little bits of energy from your environment, but you do not control the environment. So that means, you know, that the, the light that's in your room right now, that's what we have to work with. We don't influence that. And so there's a fundamental limit in that sense uh, in what we can harvest. But we're getting better and better in terms of efficiency of how much can we actually convert of what was potentially available into what becomes useful to a product. But by far the biggest influence, I think, that is that is sort of speeding up a lot of development there right now is the other side of the equation is, is how much power do I need to do something useful? So if you want to send a message from A to B and you compare how much energy do I need to do that, uh, then then you know you need you know a fraction of the power you needed 10 years ago to send that same message. Uh, and it goes the same for computation or, or a simple sensor measurement, for example. Um, so we need less and less energy to do the same thing. Uh, so, so those lines are essentially intersecting. Right? The amount of energy that we can reliably harvest is intersecting with the amount of, amount of energy that we need to do useful things in our products. Uh, so that that makes it for the first time also commercially actually useful. You know, we can have a real impact on the life of a product. Yeah. Well, there, there must be a compound effect as well, right? So, you know, not not having to use so much en- energy and, and being able to harvest more of it. Um, you know, these things working in conjunction surely, surely are quite powerful. Um, just to go back one step um, for some of our listeners and viewers that may not understand the, the premise of energy harvesting. Very simply put, uh, can you explain what that is? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's essentially the equivalent of, of of having a solar panel on your roof. It's, it's no more complicated than that, right? So there's a, a difference being that it's miniaturized and and a lot cheaper. 
Uh, but if you take the example of light, for example, uh, you, uh, although it doesn't have to be light, you can harvest power from temperature gradients, from movements, vibrations, from, from radio frequency signals. But very often people do opt for light. Uh, but then that's in most cases just the light in your house, right? It's indoor. Uh, it's the light uh, from lamps, uh, so very low intensity lights. It goes to this really small little low cost solar panel, a few square centimeters, you know, tens of cents. Um, and what you get from that uh, is, is this, this, this tiny little uh, current. And the difficulty with that is, is that it's a little bit all over the place. So the voltage tends to be very low and it's fluctuating a lot. Uh, so it's essentially unusable. You cannot really do anything with that yet. Uh, so then what go comes after that is a conversion step, power management. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really where we come in. Uh, and we have to make out of this weird sort of fluctuating low voltage, we have to make a nice and steady uh, output at the right voltage. Uh, that's tricky because it's continuously changing um, uh, and that then goes you know, in most cases uh, to some sort of storage elements could be a capacitor supercapacitor could sometimes just be a rechargeable mm. battery uh, mm. and then empowers the rest of the system um, mm. so that's that's sort of how how what, what roughly the building blocks are uh, so you go from source to harvester power management storage and uh, and, and the rest of the system mm. Yeah, it's it, it, it's interesting you should say that because we had uh, Dean Nelson on recently from Virtual Power Systems VPS. Um, he sits on the board at, uh, or is it, sorry, it's a street strategic advisor at the Autonomy Institute in North America and working mm. with Edgex. Um, and he and he and he talks quite openly about you know the problem with being able to store energy right and this actually being a being a, a, an issue when it comes to building the digital infrastructure with yeah. the advent of 5g etc um you know this premise has been around for a while right energy harvesting as such but it's rare you see a company like yours actually trying to productize it you know it, it's one of the limitations the storing element or why haven't we seen more people looking at this to date currently in your opinion yeah no, so, so there's a few reasons and the first one i kind of already mentioned is that if you go back 10 years from now and you were trying to do what we're doing today uh that that would have been a pointless endeavor simply because the amount of power that you could harvest is not enough to have a significant impact uh, on, on a product they just consumed more energy than what you could harvest right so then then it's not very useful uh, so that's that's more of an enabling factor but it's not enough on its own i think i think the second thing that we saw is that really all of the traditional solutions that have been available uh, and they've come available over the last you know, six or seven years or so. Uh, they've had they've had a few very big limitations, and and they tend to be relatively expensive, big and complex to implement. Uh, and in practice, uh, a lot of the devices where you can use energy harvesting tend to be the opposite. They tend to be relatively cheap, small, uh, simple products, right? little little sensor tags and, and and things of that nature, the television remote control and a shelf label in the supermarkets, right? simple products. Uh, whereas energy harvesting is the opposite. Um, so so the, the, the cost of implementation and the difficulty of implementation uh, typically uh, exceeded uh, the, the, the value add that you could get from energy harvesting. And so on the one hand, you have this, can I harvest enough power for it to actually be useful? Uh, and then the second part of it, how difficult is it to implement? Well, it's difficult. It used to be difficult. It used to be pretty expensive. You need a lot of space in your product uh, and it's quite complex. It really requires know-how of energy harvesting. Um, and that's kind of where our thesis came from, saying, how can we make this cheaper, smaller, simpler? Uh, because that's what's really going to enable this. We have to make it kind of a no-brainer. So, of course, we're not going to continuously swap batteries. You're going to put in energy harvesting once, which is as simple as can be, and then you're done with it. Mm. Three great words to live by, cheaper, smaller, uh, and... Yeah, sorry, it goes what? for a lot of products, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot the third one. <laughs> I was saying three great words, and I forgot the third one. But, uh, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it, go, it goes for a lot of products. It goes for a lot of services, right? Um, can, can we dig down a little bit more into actually um, no -E? So I called it now -E at the start. You called it no -E, no e now -E, tomato, <laughs> yeah, tomato. Um, can we dig down a little bit... Yeah. <laughs> Can we dig down a little bit more into the key features of the, some of the solutions that you're doing and, and, and why it is it's quite special? Because it's, it's very interesting, the work that you're doing. Yeah, so, so we, you know, like I said, we, we started uh, uh, almost five years ago um, uh, and, and uh, now our first product is available. So it took us quite a bit of time to get from that sort of initial ad academic research to something that is commercially, you know, in mass production available and we can ship millions of parts. Um, and a big part of that is that uh, we had to essentially start from scratch. So we have a fundamentally different topology and a different design than anything that's been on the market up to this point. 
Um, whereas all of the solutions we've seen to date are essentially using an inductive topology, uh, which means they're using inductors to do their uh, voltage conversion or voltage boosting. Um, and that is fine. It's a decent way to reach uh, good performance, but it has a few very big limitations. And, and the biggest one is that, well, that you simply need inductors. <laughs> In total, you need about 15 external components uh, that, that eats up a lot of space on the PCB, space that very often is simply not available. Uh, and it also, uh, you have to buy those components, so it's simply expensive, right? You get an expensive bill of material, uh, and then you need to configure them in the right way. So that adds quite a bit of complexity, and, and you need to do that in the right way to actually get good performance. So you need a bit of know-how on, on what you're doing, and that know-how to date is almost non-existent in the market. Um, so in our design, instead of having those 15 external components, we essentially have one very, very small external capacitor. It's less than one cent in, in high volume. Uh, so that makes it much cheaper to implement. Uh, also makes the PCB footprint, you know, depending how you do it, somewhere between 10 to 30 times smaller in your in your product. Um, and there, you know, there essentially is no configuration. The, the chip is completely self-programming. So you just put it in, and that's it. You're done. You know, you have maximum performance. So it's uh, it's as simple as can be in that sense. Uh, and we think for a lot of applications that that is really sort of pushing them to say, okay, well, you know, we can do this. This is not some sort of exotic science project. This is something we could put in a product tomorrow and it works. Yeah. I mean, it, it's fantastic. And it's great that you've done that. And, and it's interesting that you ended that by saying this isn't just a science product. This is something, uh, a science project. This is a, this is something we can put in a product uh, and sell. And I think that's the main difference sometimes between the theoretical view of researchers and, and what you may learn at university and what you may study versus real world applications and commercial uses. Um, and, and you've clearly taken that step, haven't you, over the last five years, and you've been able to actually turn this into something that people will buy and people will use. Uh, do you, was, was that difficult, you know, going, going through, fit, um, you know, the theory and actually turning it into a, a commercial, uh, a viable entity? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of steps there. Uh, part of it is that um, um, I think the hard thing with, with, with starting a company is that, uh, is that in the beginning, you only have a PowerPoint presentation, right, or a very bad prototype, uh, but we did need a lot of customer feedback. Um, so we've been trying to do sort of really at the earliest sort of worst performing prototypes that we had in the early beginning to already be able to do some sort of pilot and prototyping together with customers to get feedback. Uh, and it's especially, I think, that simplicity part. So we were quite convinced that if you make something more cost effective and smaller, that that is attractive, right? That gets you gets you in the door uh, and, and, and people are interested. But I think that final step and actually uh, putting it in your product is really simplicity. It's, it's, it's having a very quick design time. And in the end of the day, you know, trusting this, this, that this works. Um, and, and I think there, you know, the more complex it is, uh, the more scary it gets. This is something most companies have never done. Uh, uh, and if you make it in a way that you need a lot of know-how to get it to work, you know, decently, uh, that only makes it more scary. Right? So, so yeah. that's I think we spend a lot of time on making it as simple as possible to implement and getting to your peak performance as quickly as you possibly can. Yeah. Well, it's those three words again, right? You know. Uh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> this will be a reoccurring theme in this talk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh no, but, but it's amazing. Um, you know, it's really, really important. And I think, you know, one of the things that, of course, we need to touch upon here is battery waste pollution. You know, this is, a, yeah. this is a this is a this is a this is a massive problem in the world, um, and 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 you know this is a positive environmental impact that energy harvesting can have. Um, it, put in the, put, I mean, you know, it, it's it's fairly, you know, it's fairly easy to see the comparisons between the two, but putting that into a real world context, you know, how how much difference can energy harvesting make compared to the massive issue yeah. that we have with battery I said the, the numbers pollution. are incredible but but it, you know it starts i think very sort of uh, philosophical almost in saying sort of the way we look at powering our products traditionally i as a user i am completely uh, um, sort of responsible for bringing energy to my device without me my device does not work right uh, whether it's my laptop or uh, the smoke detector, I have to bring power to that device for it to keep working. Sometimes I do that by putting a cable in, and uh, sometimes I do that by periodically swapping a battery. But without me, it stops working. Um, and that, you know, right now that's annoying at best, right? It's because we don't have that many products. Uh, but I yeah. think what we saw with sort of the increase of 
or Internet of Things or you know whatever the the, the name now is, it's there's definitely a huge influx of, of connected devices, simple little things that just need continuous power so they can talk to the rest of the world. Um, and as that number increases, that becomes a problem. Uh, it, it becomes on the one hand a cost problem because uh, if you have you know, half a million sensors, uh, parking sensors, for example, deployed throughout a city, uh, and you have to swap all of those batteries every couple of years, that is a problem. Uh, but it also becomes a problem if you're a television remote control manufacturer uh, and all of a sudden you realize that as an industry you're throwing away 300 million AAA batteries every year just because that's needed for your product function, right? People have to continuously swap battery, uh, swap batteries uh, to, to keep your product working and 2% you know, of those get recycled and the rest ends up in a landfill leaking away chemicals. And, and I think definitely over the last few years what we've noticed is that sort of that realization has kicked in that we cannot keep doing that. Right. And, and regulations are, are being passed that will not only say you should do better, no, you need to do better. It mm. is no longer acceptable. So mm. it seems like a uh, sort of a almost philosophical inevitability uh, that there has to be this, this transition to, to looking at power in, in a different way. Uh, and, and probably that means me as a user, I no longer should be responsible for powering. It should be self-powering. Yeah, that's that's really poignant, isn't it? You know, that you shouldn't be responsible for it. It should be self-powering. You know, these things should be able to, yeah. to, to, to manage themselves. Uh, but I think, you know, going further than that, it's been well spoken about, you know, with, you know, you mentioned Nikola Tesla earlier, right? So, you know, Elon Musk, his business, you know, the issues with the resources and finite amount of resources to create these batteries with the big push to going towards EV. Um, you know, it, it, you know, is this is this potentially, in your view, being overshadowed, right? You know, that how are we going to get so many batteries into these cars? You know, it, it, everyone is saying about cutting down emissions and and getting rid of the internal combustion engine. Completely the right thing to do, uh, but without energy harvesting or without you know, um, you know, the maintenance of these energy stores. How how do we do that? Yeah. Well, I think one thing is that it, it's it's appealing to look at sort of the. Uh, Big things. Big things are a little bit more appealing. So it's more it's more interesting to have a discussion about uh, uh, nuclear reactors or versus uh, wind power or coal mines or something like that. Mm. Uh, but there's kind of this this macro impact of, of everything that happens at the micro scale. And so simply because there's such an incredible amount of small connected devices, uh, that means of sort of as a cumulatively uh, being responsible for a massive amount of e-waste and, and, and pollution as a result. But it's easy to overlook because if you identify it as a single thing, you think, you know, it's a television remote control, it's a smoke detector, who cares? It's, it's just one kind of triple A battery. Uh, but there's a lot of those. And I think that's 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 where sort of that that's maybe realization is starting to kick in is that as an industry is actually responsible for a massive amount of pollution. Um, and, and, you know, they need to do better and they can do better. This is available, right? So that's, uh, and, and people are doing better. So we, we've seen a, a massive increase of, uh, of, of interest really over the last uh, two years or so where, where yeah, this is not a maybe. If you if you you know we gave the example of a TV remote control, but if you buy a television two year two or three years from now, every major brand will will uh, have a solution in place that uh, no longer requires you to bring energy, right? So that will be self powered. That will solve itself. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's you know it's 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 really interesting and it's somewhat eye opening as well. Could you keep drawing? I keep drawing comparisons to the to the single uh, use of single use plastics right mm. you know that that's been so widely spoken about and 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 rightly so but i kind of feel like energy harvesting isn't on the same level that that is no, you, know, you, yeah. you know you've only got to look at places like you know mcdonald's and some of these major u.s fast food outlets changing from plastic straws to, to cardboard straws right you know but how long is it going to be before OEMs of, of, of TVs and so on do something similar when it comes to the remote. I, th I think so. the interesting thing there is what we often talk about is that for most things, if, you, if you're a consumer that wants to, you know, uh, be, be a sustainably sort of conscious consumer, it actually makes your life a little bit more difficult because I now have to think about recycling plastic and, you know, what, and, and how to deal with all of these things. Mm -hmm. I think energy harvesting is one of these few things that where you can, as a consumer, sort of be a good person uh, while do while while making your own life a bit easier because in, yeah. in really every case it either makes it cheaper because you don't have to put in the cost to swap batteries or you know and especially the if you're a company you don't have to put in the hours to have somebody driving around swapping batteries uh, but if you're a consumer uh, it just makes your life easier it's one less thing you have to think about uh, yeah you no longer have to swap a battery it just made it slightly easier 
And yeah. so you improve user experience while, while making the product uh, greener. Uh, yeah. I think that's actually quite a rare combination. It's typically the opposite. You make it greener, but the expense comes at either making it more expensive or, yeah, yeah. or less user friendly and have to do extra things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a win-win situation. And I think a lot of this starts with education, right, as well. So you yeah, know, we, yeah. need, we, need, we need to be going to the schools, don't we? We need to be start talking about energy harvesting so that it becomes second nature to people that will, you know, be the leaders and, and, and the rulers in, in, in the future. Um, but, you know, and, you know, unless we start doing that, you know, then, then, then you know, we're not going to create this wave that, that we really should be doing. Well, like, I mean, I think I agree. Like, we definitely, it, it starts with awareness, at least on the consumer level. But even without that, I, I think sort of the, the, the ball has already started rolling because even if you do not care at all about sustainability, uh, then what you do care about is just maintenance costs, so especially for the larger scale deployments. Yeah. If you're a supermarket chain and you're deploying uh, electronic shelf labels, right? So the labels uh, mm. per, in, in, in the shelves, they're, they're becoming digitized little e-paper screens. That means you have to throw away around 20 to 30,000 batteries every couple of years per supermarket store. And you have a few hundred of those stores spread around the country. You know, you're now responsible for literally millions of batteries you're throwing away. Um, you know, that, is, that has a sustainability impact, but that's also just a, a burden in terms of cost. You have to have people swapping batteries, you have to buy batteries. There's this whole sort of supply chain connected to just continuously being able to bring energy again to your device. And so you simplify your own business operations tremendously just by making them self-powered, right? So even without that sustainability push, I think that, you know, from an industry point of view, there's going to be that transition simply because it's more appealing. Uh, but from a consumer point of view, absolutely, I think there, there needs to be just more awareness uh, about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and I guess if we were being really uh, perhaps a little bit blunt with it, it's the con commercial game. But they said they've got this green element that they can talk about. Oh, yeah. Big yeah, that'll help. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, their branding. Uh, yeah, their, that, their yeah. branding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, in terms of other use cases, so you mentioned, obviously, from a, 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 a manufacturer, OEM, remote controls, etc. What, what other typical use cases can we see through energy harvesting? Yeah, so there's, I mean, think about really anything that uses drip away battery. Uh, it probably fits. Right. Uh, but but if we look at where we see the most sort of interest, so at least the first moving markets in that sense. Uh, so I mentioned just now the, the electronic shelf labels in supermarkets. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a very sort of clear cut business case there. Uh, also, just being able to do more. So right now, a lot of these products are, are limited. Uh, in their functionality because they're trying to reach, reach a certain battery life. Right? So they might say, well, my, my electronic shelf label uh, can last for five years, but I've reduced the amount of features that I can offer, right? So you cannot change the price too often uh, because then the battery will be depleted too soon. Even though we know that if you can change the pricing much more often, you could, for example, say my tomatoes are going to expire tomorrow. I will slowly decline the price over time. Uh, so I make sure I sell them out, sell them out instead of having to throw them away. And so you're able to do more actually by, by adding energy harvesting there. Uh, television remote controls I mentioned, uh, like I said, if you, if you buy a TV a few years from now, it will not have, uh, you can expect that it will be self-powered. I think uh, almost every major brand is now, uh, is now doing that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then you have this, the sensors, so industrial asset management, uh, sensoring, monitoring, these type of things. Uh, the business case is super straightforward because it tends to be extremely difficult to go back to a change of battery, not because of the cost of the battery, because the cost of the person who has to go there. Mm. And so the, the business case there is relatively simple. Um, and then the last one is wearables. Uh, so the, uh, there's a lot of companies working on solutions for not having to charge your smartwatch every couple of days. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you name it. Anything that, that, that would be great. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. Every I know, night. Right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so uh, definitely there, you know, the, you see first few coming out with it. But um, again, over the next couple of years, there'll be a lot more of those type of devices coming out. Yeah. And and, and just just on that note, so, you know, when people talk about solar panels and, and the use of solar panels, it's always been fairly cost restrictive. Uh, people have put them on their roofs. It's been really expensive, yeah, yeah. you know, sometimes for the wealthy. Um, there's grants in the UK, certainly, to in order to do this. Um, but but most people, certainly of my generation, we remember solar panels from from your calculators that you've got at yeah, school, right? Yeah. You've got a tiny little solar panel. You know, how has this technology moved on so that you can actually charge devices, uh, harvest that energy when you might be in low light situations or you're not directly under a light bulb or something? Yeah. 
No, so so a few things have happened. One, the you know again you can do more things than only solar panels, right? There's different types of harvesting, but for solar panels specifically, they've just gotten a lot cheaper. Uh, yeah. So so you will spend tens of cents having a, a very decent little uh, few square square centimeter solar panel, uh, and you know that has good performance. Uh, the other side of the equation is is what we are doing. So that's the power management step that comes after. So the amount of power that you can kind of effectively squeeze out of it, that has also increased. Uh, so that means even the, the the PV panels that don't have great performance, you're able to get out of that a lot more uh, than you would uh, traditionally. Uh, but yeah, the price has simply gone down quite a lot. That has definitely helped. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose things like uh, uh, kinetic movement, et cetera, um you know gyros various other bits and pieces you know if you so you know, i keep talking about the remote control but you know what do people do with a remote control well they throw it across the room don't they yeah. right? you know uh you know yeah. there's got to be some power that we can we yeah, can you probably have one for your favorite sporting team and every time they lose yeah yeah yeah, them, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah i think that's why they're all rubber at the end of the day you know just yeah. they can back they can bounce off the wall um Really, really interesting, Simon. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, my, my last question to you today is, is, is where is this all going? What's the future of energy, energy harvesting in IoT applications? You know, whatever we're going to call IoT in five years time. But where, where, where do you see this going? Yeah, so I think it will increasingly become a very boring feature. Um, so so right, right now it's something interesting or special. If you put it in your product, I think that will be less and less so the case. Um, uh, you know, the, if the goal was to have near ubiquitous computing, right, or, or connectivity, uh, we want all of our sort of everyday products to be connected so things are more efficient, smarter, you name it. Um, that means all of them need a little bit of power, not much, but a bit, and they need it continuously. Uh, I think energy harvesting is the only feasible way to achieve that. And if you kind of look at the puzzle more strategically from, from sort of a, a semiconductor component point of view, uh, you essentially have the connectivity SOCs that are eating up most of the, of the functionality, right? So if you buy a Bluetooth SOC, that means you probably have enough processing power, enough memory, uh, sometimes maybe even a little bit of sensing uh, that's in that module. Uh, to, to do most of the things you want to do in that product. Um, what, what we see happening a little bit longer term is eventually power being integrated into that as well. Uh, so there'll be just complete SOCs offerings uh, or, or at least uh, integrated modules uh, that, that have this as, as a standard standard feature in there. You have energy autonomous Bluetooth, energy autonomous MBIOT, LoRa, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, so this is no longer a special thing you have to add to it, right? So that again, if you think about it from the last time, I'll say it, but the cheaper, smaller, simpler uh, <laughs> point of view, you cannot make it cheaper, smaller, simpler than simply having it integrated, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we're already seeing quite a bit of interest there. I don't think we're quite there yet now, as a, as, as the market isn't, uh, but it seems inevitable that that uh, that that's where it's going. Yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah, it's fantastic, and it's it's interesting you should say that you started by saying it will become more boring and i guess in a in a weird kind of way that's the goal right because the more boring and the more rudimentary and it is what it is it's it means it's a success it's been integrated it's now part of everyday life energy harvesting as as a concept as a as a, as, a, as a means to an end is is now in the fabric of how we create things um so so i think you know i think i think that would that would be the end goal wouldn't it yeah no absolutely uh this, this should be more of an uh, of course it has energy harvesting than uh how interesting it has energy yeah. harvesting right absolutely yeah. yeah yeah and how how long do you think it's going to take to get there so probably the, what we are seeing right now at least is that it just massively depends per uh, market segment so the, the the ones i mentioned you know, I think the ma the majority there will be in the next couple of years. So the the, the, the that's really going quite fast. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of other applications that you could think of that might need a little bit more time. Um, but but uh, for sure over the next uh, you know couple of years, you see in the in, in the applications I mentioned, uh, the majority of them picking that up. I think, and the mm -hmm. other ones maybe you know over the next decades uh, slowly. I think uh, that uh, mm -hmm. adoption will just increase there. Yeah, no, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. It's been absolutely, uh, uh, yeah, it's been absolutely, you know, amazing and eye opening. And I hope our viewers and listeners um, look into this a little bit more. Uh, where can they find out more about Noe, about your company, about you? elsewhere online so we can drop some stuff in the comments is there anywhere that they can go and yeah I mean, go to uh, noeenergy.com little uh, stripe in between uh, you'll find a lot of info there uh, we, were, we we try to be quite active on social media so especially on LinkedIn if you follow us there uh, there's a lot of info newsletters uh, you name it so uh, yeah if you go to the website that will definitely be the easiest starting point 
All right, fantastic. Simon, thank you so much for coming on the IoT Podcast Show. No problem. Thank you. As always, if you'd like to find out more about this episode or Noe, follow the links that Simon has mentioned. Get involved in the comments, share, subscribe. We'd love to see you on the next episode.